everybody. Thanks for being here. I think let's go ahead and jump in and get started. I am Dave Cedarberg, the uh, Outreach Coordinator for Physics and Astronomy at Purdue. Welcome to Saturday Morning Astrophysics. Uh, it's nice to see a, a good crowd here this morning. Thank you for all, uh, thank you all for, uh, for being here. We've got some volunteers that uh, on my end who will uh, help you in the breakout rooms. I'd like to have them introduce themselves briefly. Uh, just a, a name and, and uh, uh, what you study and, and let's let it go at that. Baha, let's start with you. Good thing. Hello, I am Bat. I study physics. I'm a junior here at Purdue, and uh, it's nice to go over some activities today. All right, Danielle. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a grad student, and I study physics. What kind of physics? Any kind yet? Uh, yeah, so um, the Department of Physics and Astronomy. Sorry, my Wi-Fi was uh, body for a second. Um, I study supernovae and massive stellar evolution. So I'm interested in um, how a star dies and what happens after it dies when it interacts with the environment around it. Robert, introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Robert, and I study electrical engineering. So basically, everyone else here is probably going to be more knowledgeable of physics than me. I think you know enough physics to be just fine. Uh, Cameron, let's go to you. All right, my name is Cameron Shane. I'm an undergraduate here too at Purdue, and I hope to study astrophysics. Hope to have a good time with you all today. I'm sure we all will. Um, Colton. Nice to meet everyone. I'm Colton. I'm a third year uh, student in math and physics, and I study uh, quantum computing. I think that's above my head, but uh, thanks for telling us that. <laughs> Mariana. Hi, my name is Mariana. I'm a junior in planetary science and chemistry here at Purdue. All right, thanks for being here. Ethan, what's your story? Hello, I'm Ethan. I'm a second year undergrad here, and I'm in the study physics. Thanks for being here. Uh, let's see, we have Alan, who's right here, close by. Alan. Hi, uh, my audio is going to be coming through Dave's computer. But um, my name is Alan, and I'm a senior here at Purdue, also studying physics. OK, uh, let's see. I think we've got a, did I forget anybody? I don't think I did, but oh, what about you? The, the main guy. <laughs> well, we'll get to you at some point uh, as, we, as your turn comes up. But yes, we need to have uh, Professor Giannios introduce himself. Hello, everybody. Welcome on this Saturday morning. I'm uh, Dimitrios Giannios, professor here at uh, Purdue at the Physics and Astronomy Department. And I work on uh, compact objects in theoretical astrophysics problems involving compact objects, all this uh, fun uh, activity objects like black holes and uh, neutron stars. And today we'll be discussing about redshift. So compact objects, those would be, you mentioned black holes. What else would be a compact object? Uh, I guess whatever is left after the death of a star, so it can be a black hole, uh, or less extreme objects like uh, uh, neutron stars, uh, where uh, uh, the core of a star collapses and gives you an object of a size of 10 kilometers or so. So you squeeze the mass of the sun in a region of 10 kilometers. So that's the less, the least, the less extreme compact object. Or even more mundane objects like white dwarfs, where you squeeze this, uh, our sun in the end of its life to the size of the Earth. So these are the least compact of the compact objects. I've talked to some of your grad students and it's fascinating work. So we hope to hear more about that uh, at some point. Um, okay, I think we all know who each other are. Uh, a word to our students that are with us. If you have a question, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and, uh, and speak up, we don't mind. You can raise your hand, uh, you can put something in the chat. We'll be watching the chat. If you wanna put a question there or a comment, that's fine too. Um, I, I want to remind you that we're going to record this session. Some people weren't 
are, are not able to be with us today. So we'll record the session and have it uh, available to them uh, to, to view later on. <laughs> okay, so uh, we, we gave you a little bit of uh, information in the beginning, uh, one of which was to download the FIFOX app and then to, uh, to take a look at the sound generator, the audio generator that we gave you the link for, and to maybe try the experiment uh, to, see, to see how you did. Uh, before we get started, we're gonna do something a little later on, but we need to kind of prep uh, in, in advance. Danielle, tell us what to do. All right, so um, get your balloon and get a Sharpie. So make sure it's some sort of permanent marker. Um, it, a dry erase marker will not work. Um, if you don't have a Sharpie handy, you can use a dark colored pen, but be careful not to puncture the balloon when you're making dots. So kind of what we're going for is making little dots on the balloon like this. They don't have to be super big. Um, put a few on there and um, kind of go down to about where I have the dots on this balloon and put it to the side. If you wanna put it on a little piece of paper while it dries so you don't get Sharpie on anything, that is probably um, the best way for it to dry without uh, damaging your clothes or your table. All right, so let's move along. Uh, we're gonna have a poll, okay? We'd like to ask you some questions. So I'm gonna bring up a poll. Take a look at the questions. We'll give you a few minutes to answer. So the first poll question is about colors of light. Seeing colors of light uh, from Earth, maybe from a galaxy far away. This is a multiple answer question. So select as many answers as you think are correct. All right, so we have, uh, let's see, uh, about a third of you are saying number one is correct, uh, about half of you, number two is correct, about half, number three is correct. Let's end the poll. Different colors of light we see from Earth, from a galaxy far away, um, are traveling to Earth at different speeds. Light, you've probably heard of the concept of the speed of light. In, in science, uh, we, we give that the letter C as, as a, an algebraic abbreviation. Um, the speed of light is a universal constant. Under the same, no, light will travel at different speeds in different media, but in the, the uh, emptiness of space and, and uh, from galaxies to Earth, Life is traveling at the same speed, regardless of color. Not only light, uh, other, other forms of electromagnetic, electromagnetic radiation. So radio waves, gamma rays and X-rays and infrared light and ultraviolet light. Those are all EM or electromagnetic radiation types. They all travel at the same speed, the speed of light. Anybody know what the speed of light is? Unmute yourself and tell me. Somebody knows. Isn't it 290 something thousand mile kilometers a second? Yeah, yeah. So you know, we're, we're just going to round it and say uh, 300, uh, three times 10 to the eighth or 300 million uh, miles, uh, not miles, uh, <laughs> meters per second. Okay. Uh, Light from different galaxies have different wavelengths, but travel at the same speed. That's true. Different color, different wavelength. And depending on the distance, uh, if, if the galaxy, now we, we say may depend on the changing distance between the galaxy and the earth. That a changing distance means that it's in motion. So if the galaxy is moving away, the light will appear differently from what it would be if it was standing still, or we might say at rest. And we'll, we'll get into that concept in a, little, in a little bit, but we have a resting color or a resting uh, wavelength and a wavelength in motion. And they can be different depending on how fast the galaxy is moving or you know, in terms of an observer and, uh, and a source, which is the whole point of our first activity, which we're gonna get to right now. So we have breakout rooms, don't we, Alan? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what uh, we have, uh, how many breakout rooms? Uh, three. We have three breakout rooms. And can students uh, pick a, whichever breakout room they choose? 
No, I have them assigned. We have them assigned. Okay, let's do breakout rooms. Do you have a calculator with you? Do you have your phone with FIFOX? And do you have your sound source ready? Now, if you maybe don't, other people in the breakout room will, and our TAs can, can help you with that as well. So um, we, if, if you don't have those available, we can learn from the, the people, other people in the room. Alan, can we go? Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll see you in about 10 minutes. Okay, do we have everybody back? It looks like everybody's back. Okay. Um, we're gonna move on. I'm gonna have Professor Giannios take over and, and show you uh, a PowerPoint with some uh, to kind of pick up where we're leaving off here and, um, and, and go on to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, go on to what we want to cover next. So, Professor, may I just turn the meeting over to you? Sure, thank you. So just to say that uh, you should feel free to interrupt, uh, just speak up or write a comment. I'm not going to read the comments, but uh, some of the TAs will... Uh, ask the question on your behalf, or you just interrupt and ask the question on the spot. Please be uh, brave. Um, so what we have uh, heard so far uh, is we were exposed to this Doppler effect, and we realized that uh, when there is a, a sound, which is of course a wave, uh, the frequency with which we, we hear this uh, sound depends on the motion of the source with respect uh, uh, to the observer. Uh, similar effect uh, is applying to light waves, and that's our way of looking at the universe and measuring actually velocities of objects like uh, galaxies. And with this method, the Doppler method, we made some profound discoveries about our own uh, universe. Uh, so let's take it uh, from the beginning. Uh, here, by now you should have seen this uh, expression. That is uh, the Doppler effect for sound waves. Uh, this uh, relation, this expression gives a relation of uh, the velocity of uh, the source relative to the detector uh, and uh, the change in the wavelength uh, of the sound. Lambda observer is the wavelength of, uh, uh, the, that is measured by the observer and uh, lambda source is the wavelength of uh, the sound waves as produced by the source. Now, in this expression here, uh, you will uh, uh, find a constant C sub S, which is the speed of sound. Of course, we are talking about sound waves. This formula knows something about the speed of sound. And uh, that is a, indeed a very high, uh, large uh, speed. Uh, assume that uh, uh, you know this. Uh, so it's actually 340 meters per second. So if I shout at you uh, and you are 340 meters away from me, you will hear me shouting one second uh, later. Now, a very similar formula uh, applies uh, to light waves. Uh, of course, in that case, we don't care about the speed of sound, but we care about the speed of light. So how do you think the speed of light compares to the speed of sound? The speed of light is faster. Anybody else wants to give it a try? How fast? We mentioned this already in, in the class today. So how far is go light is going in one second? Uh, 300 million, I think. Right. So not 300 meters like sound, but uh, light is the fast dude, is the road runner of waves. It's actually the fastest, uh, uh, you know, the, the fastest of all. It moves 300 million meters for one second. If we shine a flashlight towards uh, the moon, how long does it take for the light to make it to the moon? That's going to take uh, a second, an hour or one day? What is your guess? OK, 
Come on, give it a try. Uh, we have some answers in the chat. Does some of the TAs going to tell me what are the, is the discussion? Oh, could you, um, one of them asked if you could repeat the question again. Okay, so we are shining light uh, from the earth towards the moon. Uh, so we try to communicate with someone on the moon. We shine light and the question is how long does light take to travel from the earth to the moon? We've got a flurry of answers now. A lot of people saying one second. And that's more or less right. It's just over one second. In a, merely a second, the light can travel from the earth uh, to the moon. Looking at uh, the stars and the galaxies with light, with electromagnetic waves, we can look at large distances because the light propagates so fast, we can get information about uh, uh, the universe. The Doppler expression, the Doppler effect when it comes to light is given by this expression here. It is very similar expression with what we learned already about sound. But here we have C, the speed of light, instead of C sub S, which was the speed of sound. Otherwise, the expression is very similar. By looking at the wavelengths of a source uh, and comparing uh, the observed wavelength to the source wavelength of light, we can measure the velocity of such a source with respect to us uh, on Earth. Now, when the source is moving away from us, the wavelengths are getting longer. Uh, just like the sound waves when you are moving your uh, uh, smartphone away uh, from uh, uh, the laptop. On the other hand, when the source like a galaxy is approaching us, then the observed wavelengths are shorter with respect to the ones produced uh, by the source. And that is a great tool because we can measure the speeds of objects like galaxies in our universe. Now, since I started discussing things like wavelength and the color and so on and so forth for the light, is a good moment to take a second uh, poll to refresh our knowledge about what is the relation between wavelength, frequency, and speed of propagation of light. So one of our TAs will take over now. Okay, I think uh, I'll just do that, uh, uh, Professor, thank you. So we're gonna launch our second poll and uh, we'll get started right now. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna finish up the poll here in five, four, three, two, one. We're ending the poll. All right, so, um, Professor, we have uh, a number of people saying that uh, light traveling from Earth to, to, from a galaxy to Earth travels at different speeds. Uh, we have some people, about half of us, say that they have different wavelengths, but the same speed, and that would be correct. Uh, and the color depends on the changing distance between the galaxy and the Earth, and that would be correct too. And I think. I think that's where you're headed with uh, with your next topic. So uh, let's go ahead and proceed. Oh, yes, thank you. Okay, so I stop the sharing, I guess. All right. Yes, so let's see about the nature of uh, uh, light and uh, the color. Of course, you are all aware of the rainbow colors, the uh, basic colors uh, of, uh, you know, uh, that you see when uh, you get the rain and the sun. And you get the red and the green and the yellow uh, and the blue. These are characterized, these different colors have different wavelengths. But light is light. No matter its wavelength, no matter its color, it always propagates with the speed of light. And guess what? It's, yeah, it's the speed of light. It's a constant. Uh, and no matter how we try to measure it, we always come up with the same persistent number, approximately 300 million meters uh, per second. Um, now, uh, since light waves are uh, waves, they are having a characteristic expression that relates the wavelength uh, of uh, this uh, oscillation to their frequency. In fact, if you multiply the wavelength times the frequency, 
the product equals to the speed of light uh, c. So lambda, which is the wavelength and is measured in meters, times the frequency, which has units of one over second, equals to the speed of light, which of course we measure it in meters per second. So the product of wavelength times frequency is a constant, is the speed of light, no matter what is the wavelength of the wave. Now, looking at this expression here, lambda times f equals to a constant, what is the relation that you believe that uh, wavelength and frequency for light uh, have? Are, is one related to the other or they don't care of each other? So think about this. When you have a product of two quantities being a constant, uh, what does it mean about these two quantities? When, for example, one of them gets larger, like the wavelength becomes longer, what happens to the frequency? You can write something on your chat or just interfere and give me the answer. Okay, we have some answers. Joseph says it's a direct relationship. Jack says the frequency has to become lower. Right, okay. So what Zach says is that when the wavelength becomes longer, so that the, this product remains constant, the frequency has to become smaller, lower, so that the product of the two quantities is constant. Mathematically, we call that uh, we say that uh, these two quantities are inversely proportionally related. When one quantity increases, the other quantity decreases. So. When we have long wavelengths, we have low frequencies. Long wavelengths, uh, by the long wavelengths, we usually, uh, for the visible light, we refer to the red part of the spectrum, to the red light. On the other end of the rainbow, we have the purple, which is characterized by high frequencies and short wavelengths. Now you can have a look here in this uh, plot and uh, let's try to identify what we call wavelength for uh, an oscillation. For example, can someone help me identify what is the wavelength, for example, of the red light, of the red curve that we have over here? I would like a brave student to speak up and uh, Tell me how I can find the wavelength here. So, of course, we can't measure because there are no units there. But if you wanted to explain to someone to let's say you want to explain to a classmate how they could take a ruler and measure the length of one wave, you would measure from where to where. For instance, uh, should I start measuring from the peak of this wave and go till the uh, bottom here and say this is one wavelength? That could be one way to, to call it wavelength. But is this the correct answer? We see at least one answer in the chat. Sophia Cruz says from the crest to the trough. Jack says from trough to trough. Mm -hmm. Right. So to measure the wavelength, we have to start from one position and go to the same position again. If we decide to start from a peak, then we have to make it to the next peak. And the distance between the two peaks is uh, the wavelength. Is it clear to everybody? You can start from uh, the bottom, and that's my uh, official terminology. That's the bottom of the wave. And you make it to the next uh, bottom. And this is the wavelength. Now pay attention, how long is the wavelength for the red light and how long is for the purple light? Uh, which of the two waves has the shorter uh, wavelength? You can see it by eye. You don't need any you know, ruler in that case. The purple. Exactly, the purple. Look at the purple. The distance between these uh, two lower points is that much. The wavelength is much shorter than what you have for the red uh, light. 
So when it comes to a purple light, the wavelength is short and the frequencies are high. So that's an important property of light. But what I want you also to keep out of this is no matter what is the frequency of the light, no matter its color, they all propagate with the same speed. Well, the speed of light. Now, uh, that is very useful property in uh, uh, astronomy, in astrophysics, because we can uh, measure through this Doppler formula the speed of different objects like galaxies. But before we understand how we do this uh, measurement, we have to give you one more piece of information that um, the light we get from such sources has characteristic lines. Uh, and uh, uh, Dave, I believe, has prepared a very nice demonstration to show us how the lines of different objects form depending on their chemical composition, depending on what material these objects are made uh, of. So, All right, believe... Professor, if you will stop sharing your screen, I will take over the uh, visual and... Ah, okay, yeah, I have to stop, of course. <laughs> okay, so I, I have an apparatus here. I'm, I'm going to uh, show you what I've got. I, no, okay, I think my screen locked up for a minute. I have a tube that's filled with several different gases. I have one filled with oxygen, one filled with hydrogen, helium, and some other gases. I'm gonna run a current, an electrical current through the tube and make it glow. This works just like a neon light would work. We're gonna look at that through what's called a diffraction grating. This does the same thing that a prism would do, just like the prism you saw in, the previous, in, in a previous slide. When light shines through it, it spreads the light apart in two different wavelengths. So the apparatus that I have, I'm gonna switch cameras for a minute. I have two boxes here, each of which uh, will run electrical current through the gas tube. Now I'm gonna have Alan turn off the lights and we're going to look at the tube with the diffraction grating and you're looking now at just the light coming from the tube. When I put the diffraction grating in front of the screen, you see, you see uh, bands of color of different wavelength, different frequency, and as we would interpret it with our eyes, different colors. Now, this is hydrogen. This is a form of hydrogen, the most abundant element in the universe. And these lines are what we call spectral lines. They are unique to this kind of atom. I'm gonna turn this light off and turn on a different one. And this one is xenon one of the noble gases, xenon. And you see that the pattern of lines is different. There are different colors and they're in different positions. So I'm gonna go back to the form of hydrogen again, and you see how much different this, these lines appear. And compared to xenon, how much different these appear compared to the form of hydrogen. Alan, turn the lights on again, if you would, please. So when we look at, when we talk about spectra of stars or galaxies, and as the professor pointed out, these are unique to the chemical makeup of, of, that, uh, of that thing, whether it's a galaxy star or whatever. Each of those colors corresponds to an electron transition from a high energy to a low energy, spitting out a photon or a particle of light. And that's where those colors come from. Now, Professor is going to point out the uh, spectrum on, on the slide now is a different kind of spectrum, but the, the principle is the same. The lines, whether they're bright lines or dark lines, come from those electron transitions within a specific atom. Okay, Professor? 
Exactly. Thank you, Dave. So when we are looking at the galaxy, we see, of course, different uh, colors, but then we see this characteristic dark spots uh, in the light from or in the spectrum from the galaxy, which correspond to these different uh, elements that you've, we find in this specific uh, galaxy. Of course, we measure these uh, elements on Earth as well, so we know at which frequencies we expect to see these dark uh, uh, lines. Now, that allows us, uh, looking at the galaxies, to exploit uh, uh, the formula for the Doppler shift and measure its velocity with respect uh, to us. Let's go back to this expression we discussed before and notice that uh, here at the right hand side, we have a ratio with a dimensionless number. Since wavelength is measured in what? In meters. If you divide meters by meters, you get a dimensionless number. Well, in astronomy, we decided to call this uh, dimensionless number redshift, Z. So we substitute this expression, calling Z this uh, uh, ratio here. That simplifies our expression, where the velocity, because we are lazy people in astrophysics, we make our life simpler. We simplify the expression to call the velocity of the galaxy C times the redshift Z. How do we measure now the redshift? This is the spectrum of a galaxy if the galaxy were not moving with respect to us. And this is a spectrum of a galaxy that is actually moving. What do we notice here? We notice that all the lines have moved in some specific direction. Can you tell me if whether the uh, lines of this moving galaxy are towards the red or the blue part of the spectrum? Just look at these dark spots and compare the two uh, images. The upper one is the galaxy at uh, as it's producing light at rest. And the bottom is uh, how we see this uh, light arriving on Earth. Professor, we have uh, one answer from, uh, from Jack um, that says red. Exactly. Let's, let's pay attention to this. This plenty of lines here have moved towards the redder part. These lines over there shifted again towards the red direction. And even this red line became even more red. Notice that all these dark lines moved in the same way, parallel to each other, all towards the red. So we can measure the red shift from all those different uh, lines, and that allow us to measure the velocity uh, of the galaxy. In fact, you can become uh, uh, astronomers uh, on your own right now, uh, and uh, I'll, I'm going to ask you to figure out what a galaxy is doing uh, uh, with respect to us. Uh, imagine that uh, we know for a galaxy, we see these dark lines, and we observe this line at wavelength of uh, 401 nanometers, or 401 times 10 to the minus ninth meters. These are the units typic of typical wavelength we can see with our eyes. On the other hand, we know the resting wavelength uh, of this uh, uh, line, which is at uh, L source, lambda source, which is 393 nanometers. Now, with this information alone, you can decide whether this uh, uh, galaxy is moving towards us or away uh, from us. So take a moment to think about this. We have uh, some emission radiation at the source that happens at this wavelength of 393 nanometers. And on the other hand, we observe the source at a wavelength of 401 nanometers, which is a longer wavelength. Can you guess whether the source is moving towards us or away from us? Uh, actually, you could try your thumbs up or thumbs down or just uh, type on the chat. Well, we do have one answer from Mr. Jack again, saying it's moving away. And why is that, Zach? Why do you think the galaxy is moving away from us? 
I didn't mean to intimidate you, Chuck. You are right, but why? <laughs> We have other answers also. So Jack's explanation is because of the negative exponent. Because of the negative, excuse me? The negative exponent, the negative nine. Ah, here, Jack pays the attention to the uh, negative exponent. Let's forget about the exponent for, for now. And just look at the wavelength. Which number is larger in the, uh, from other two? Lambda source is 393, while lambda observer is 400 to 1 in some units. Which of the two is longer wavelength? And that question goes to everybody. So what is more? If I have 400 to one, uh, uh, whatever, pencils or 393 pencils? All right, another thing from Jack saying the observed wavelength is longer. Right, so that is the key here. The observed wavelength is longer than that of the source. That actually means that this, the source is moving away from us. It's like the Doppler effect in the sound. When the source is moving away from us, we are receiving uh, uh, longer wavelengths. Okay, so whenever the wavelength becomes longer, when the, whenever the observed wavelength becomes longer, the source is moving away from us. Now, the strength of the Doppler formula is that not only we know that these sources move away from us, but we can calculate how fast this is happening. So to calculate the velocity, we have to go directly to the Doppler formula and plug in uh, the numbers. Professor, but before you go on, could I just want to ask if anybody has a question. Um, are we all on the same page? So we're looking at the resting wavelength of 393, never mind the, the exponents are the same. So if I don't mention them, uh, it's, it's a relative measurement. So 393 times 10 minus nine meters versus the observed wavelength, which means when we look at the object at the galaxy, that's the wavelength we see. So we're seeing a wavelength longer than the wavelength would normally be if it was not moving, if it's resting. So the longer wavelength means that the waves are being stretched out. And that means that it must be moving away. Does, does anyone have a question before we, before we uh, do the calculation? An anybody, I mean, raise your hand or just speak up or uh, give me a thumbs up if you're okay. Well, I will ask you the question then, since you don't. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> Professor, things are. I'm. I'm. I think we're good. Ah, okay, good, good. Now, not only we can say that this is moving away from us, but uh, uh, we can calculate with what velocity uh, this galaxy is moving away from us. All we need to do is go back to the uh, Doppler formula we have shown before. The velocity of the galaxy will be equal to the speed of light times the redshift. Uh, and the redshift is given, given by this ratio of the wavelengths. Now, pay a bit attention to this calculation because you will also be asked to become astronomers and calculate the velocity of another uh, galaxy. Here, you just need to substitute first the, the two wavelengths, the wave, wavelength uh, lambda observer minus lambda source and divided by the lambda source. To make your life easier, you can make first the subtraction in the denominator over there. Uh, and uh, then you can write it as this ratio here. You keep the speed of light C for now and notice here that in this fraction, you have 
both nominator and denominator as 10 to the minus 9 and meters. And these quantities will cancel out. So really, you have to divide just 8.5 divided by 393. And then substitute the value for the speed of light, which I remind you here, C equals to 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Now, if you do this little bit of a, a math, you figure out that, that uh, the velocity of this galaxy uh, is uh, 6,480 kilometers per second. We'll get in, of course, in meters per second because we have the speed of light meters per second. It's okay, you can always use the fact that uh, 1,000 meters is one kilometer. Was there an interruption in my, when I was speaking? Because it's a bit unstable there. Okay. I think that has been okay. So we can calculate the velocity of the galaxy in this example. The galaxy is flying away from us at 6,000 kilometers per second. Every second that passes, this galaxy is 6,500 kilometers further away uh, from us. It's on a race from us for some reason. Maybe it doesn't like us anymore. So, okay, let's look at another uh, galaxy. Uh, and here is your challenge. You should figure out what this galaxy is doing with respect to us. I leave you here with these numbers. It's uh, from another uh, galaxy, actually a, name, a nearby galaxy, uh, where we have again uh, the wavelength of the source and the wavelength of the that is observed. Uh, and then we want again to calculate what velocity is this galaxy having with, with respect to uh, Earth. I think that's a good time for you to go to your breakout rooms and take a few minutes to figure out the answer. All right, Professor, if you will stop sharing your screen for a moment. So before we go to breakout rooms, I just want to remind everybody, we, we sent you this page that has uh, the numbers on it for the problem that, uh, that you're going to solve. So here's the example that Professor just did at the top. And then here's the example that, that you're, you're going to do yourself. So right here are the numbers that we just gave you on the, on the PowerPoint. So we have the resting wavelength, the observed wavelength, and the speed of light to remind you what that is. You can use this page or write it on your own paper. We're going to send you to breakout rooms and see if you can calculate the velocity of the second galaxy. Does anybody have a question before we go? OK, I'm going to have Alan send us to breakout rooms. Let's take maybe five or six minutes. We're running a little short on time. Let's see if we can do this in about five minutes, OK? All right, Alan, let's go to breakouts. Okay, we are back, and uh, we're going to go back to uh, Professor Gianios. And uh, I, I know some of you have some answers in your from your breakout rooms. So let's see how you compare to what we're going to do next. Professor, take it away. Ah, uh, okay. So I, I'm not going then to to ask you what is the answer. I'm just going to to announce you, I guess, what is the, this galaxy is doing. So as you have guessed, I think by now correctly, uh, the observed wavelength for this galaxy is shorter, tiny bit, but still shorter than the source wavelength. So that indicates actually that the uh, wavelengths are squeezed, which indicates that the galaxy is moving towards uh, us. How fast is that? Well, we can ask uh, again, uh, apply again the same formula for the Doppler shift. And then if you apply it correctly, you actually find the negative answer. Min minus 91.4 kilometers per second. The minus stands exactly for the fact that the galaxy is moving towards us. And approximately its velocity is 100 kilometers for every second. 
it's coming against us. In fact, that's a nearby a galaxy, and uh, you may even be able to recognize this galaxy. Here I have uh, taken uh, this um, uh, photo from uh, the Facebook account of the galaxy. So have a look. Does it look uh, familiar to you, this one? It's a celebrity. Any guesses what is this galaxy? It's a nearby large galaxy that is actually <laughs> moving towards us by 100 kilometers after every second that passes. Yes, someone had a response. Andromeda. There we go. Wow. So I hear correctly that's Andromeda galaxy? I had a bit of interruption, but I assume, yes, that you guessed correctly. That's a famous uh, one, uh, has many followers at uh, Facebook. And yes, indeed, it's Andromeda. It's coming towards our own galaxy, the Milky Way, with this uh, uh, speed. And in fact, it is estimated that uh, 3 billion years from now, we are going to merge and become one uh, large uh, galaxy. So th that is our future. Now, moving on a different uh, uh, step, the, with this uh, uh, tool, we can uh, systematically, uh, using the Doppler effect, we can uh, systematically measure velocities of many galaxies. This happened 100 years ago, where Humboldt uh, looked and um, uh, measured uh, the velocity of a dozen or so galaxies uh, relatively close uh, to us. Uh, and uh, at that point, nobody knew exactly how you expect uh, uh, galaxies to move. One guess could be that some galaxies are moving away and some others coming closer to us, more like molecules in the air, or let's say bees around the beehive, they are moving all over the place. But what he found was very uh, exciting. For these galaxies, he could measure how fast they are moving relative to us and what is the distance of these uh, galaxies. And he made the following plot here. The x-axis shows the uh, uh, distance of a galaxy. The y-axis shows the velocity. And when the velocities are positive, uh, it means that the galaxy moves away from us. And its dot, its red spot here, corresponds to a specific galaxy. So he found something amazing. Can you guess? What can you see in this? Uh, plot about this uh, uh, red uh, dot? Uh, the farther they are away, the faster they move. Look at this here. Yeah, that's very correct. These galaxies that are far away from us at large distance are the ones that are moving the fastest away from us. Another big realization from this plot is that everything seems to be moving away from us. There are practically no galaxies with negative velocities, okay, with the exception of our Andromeda uh, friend here. The rest of the galaxies are moving away from us. And not only that, as uh, you commented, the further away the galaxy, the fastest is moving away from us. The universe is expanding and everything is moving away from us. Let's just visualize how this uh, happens. Well, by your simulation of the universe. Time to blow some balloons. All right, so hopefully everyone has affixed dots to their balloons. Um, and hopefully it's dry. I've noticed that I'm kind of getting Sharpie all over my hands. So if that is happening to you, make sure you wash your hands after the Zoom call so you don't get Sharpie on everything. Um, so our, we, are, we have a model in front of us of our own universe. So on this scale, um, let's look at each of our dots that we've made. And these are equivalent to galaxies in our universe. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to blow our balloon up. And so give our balloon a few good stretches just because that makes it easier to blow. Um, and so we are going to blow our balloon up. And so before we do so, I want everyone to inspect your universe and kind of 
look at your dots and see how far away from each other they are. Mine kind of look like they're about a half centimeter to maybe, maybe two centimeters apart. Um, and so once you've fully expe uh, uh, inspected your universe, feel free to blow up your balloon. And blow it up about, or well, yeah, blow it up all the way. Be sure not to pop your balloon. Please don't destroy the universe. Yeah. Um, and you can tie your balloon if you want to. Um, if not, you can just pinch it. But I'm gonna try to tie up my balloon and try, hoping it doesn't pop because then someone was gonna have to uh, take over my <laughs> experiment. There we go. Great, cool. And now we have an expanded universe. And so everyone look at your balloon and tell me, you can either put in the chat or you can shout out, um, what is different about your balloon? What, what has happened since we've expanded our universe? Oh. Cool, I can see the chat. So Jack said, uh, the dots get farther apart to represent the galaxies. Um, Pablo says the space between the dots expanded, but also the dots grew, that's, that's a good observation. Great, yeah. So now we see that the space between our dots um, has expanded. Uh, Oh, and someone said, uh, does this mean we are too expanding without notice? That's a good question as well. Great. So you all have made the correct observations that, every, that the space in between everything is expanding. And so from one of our dots, can someone tell me where the center of our balloon is? If there exists a center of the universe, where is it on our balloon? Suppo supposedly the center should be a perfect sphere the, the center of a perfect sphere but since we are blowing a balloon the center is actually where the where a mouth is <laughs> <laughs> well i think the real point is we have a two-dimensional model here of our universe and if it's expanding in all directions and the features are becoming further apart uh, is there a point a center point where they're all moving away from? So, yes, I think I, ca I can take it from there. Yes, this is a two-dimensional model. We are supposed in this example to live only on the balloon. Of course, the balloon has a center, but uh, we are not living there. We all live on the, on the surface of the balloon and uh, we see everything moving away from us. But on a sphere, on the surface of a sphere, there is no uh, center. So uh, that is the picture. On one hand, we see all the galaxies moving away from us, and that could be tempting for us to think that we are special, that, well, we're anti-special, I guess nobody likes us. But that is not the case. From the point of view of any galaxy in our universe, it's exactly the same picture that is forming. A more accurate description is to think that uh, we have put raisins in a bread and we put it to bake. Now, as the bread bakes, as we know, it expands. As a result of this expansion of uh, the dough, uh, all the raisins are moving apart uh, from uh, uh, each other. There is no center uh, in this uh, structure. You can think it as the uh, infinite uh, bread, uh, where there are just raisins that are all moving away from uh, each other. So the one the, you commented very correctly that in fact space is expanding and everything moves away from everything else. Now someone a few of course started to worry that uh, what happens to our bodies because of this expansion of the universe um, and the answer is that uh, at smaller distances and structures like uh, solar systems or even the whole galaxy this expansion is not felt. This expansion of the universe is felt only at the largest distances, at the largest uh, scales. Our galaxy is held together because of the gravity 
and doesn't participate in this expansion. So rest assured, assured they are not, you are not stressed together with the universe. Of course, you are growing fast at this uh, uh, age, but uh, yes, I don't have any hope to grow anymore because of the expansion of the universe, uh, for instance. Now, when we are looking at uh, uh, galaxies, uh, far away uh, galaxies, we are actually looking back uh, in time. Uh, and uh, together with the expansion of the universe, in fact, the light, the wavelength of the light is also stretching together with uh, uh, space. When we see a red, very far away galaxy today, that actually means that the light from this galaxy was emitted many billion of years ago. The light back then in time was actually blue. Since then, this light, this electromagnetic wave traveled for all these billions of years through space. As space was expanding, the wavelength was also getting longer. At some point, it became yellow. And at some other point, uh, when space expanded even more, it turned to red. And now it's arriving to us as a red uh, uh, wavelength uh, light. Uh, but that is a result of many billions of years of expansion of uh, space. So we see now today this galaxy as it were many billions of years uh, uh, ago. Now, when we are looking actually uh, at far away objects because of this redshift effect, they are turning more and more red the further away uh, uh, they are. And they are also extremely dim objects, some that is very away from you. If you look at the light uh, far away from you, you just uh, see it very faint. So to detect the first stars and the first galaxies that formed in our uh, universe, we have to look at the red part of the light or even the infrared. Uh, and we have to have a huge uh, telescope. Now, these are exciting times for astrophysics because the James Webb telescope is ready to be launched. Uh, and uh, this December 22nd, this the launching of this huge telescope is going to go in deep uh, space. Uh, it's going to find itself uh, at three times the distance from the moon and it's going to expand and they have an eight or seven meter uh, telescope in the red and infrared part of the spectrum. We are looking at the very red uh, light and the target exactly is to discover some of the most distant galaxies we have uh, around us. I think here I will complete my discussion and I uh, open now to your uh, questions. Thank you. David, I cannot hear you. Professor, we had an interesting question come up, and that is with regard to the Big Bang. And this might be more of a theoretical question, but if we're ta talking about the universe expanding and expanding without a real center, let's go back in time to the Big Bang. Could that have been considered a center? Uh, that's, that's indeed a very good uh, question. But I think the more correct way to think about this is that at uh, this time uh, zero, when the Big Bang happened, it happened everywhere uh, at the same uh, time. So it covered a bigger region, but you had this very, very hot initial uh, conditions. And as the universe expanded uh, since then, we are getting now light of larger and larger distances away from uh, us. And by studying this light, what we figure out actually is that the conditions at the time of the Big Bang were the same uh, in all these different regions where the Big Bang uh, took place. All right, thank you. Um, Professor, if you would mind unsharing your screen. Uh, we will maybe have uh, a little discussion and, and one more thing. Um, I'm gonna, we, we have a, a final survey that I would like to ask you to take, if you would please. And Colton will put that in the chat. <clears throat> and um, if you wouldn't mind going to that link while we finish up, you can answer the survey questions 
And I thought it might be nice for us to have a chance to talk among ourselves a little bit. We have a unique uh, group here with us today because uh, some of our students, <coughs> excuse me, some of our students are from uh, Medellin, Colombia. Some of our students are from the US and some of our, we might have a student or two from other places. Um, do, do any of our students have a question they would like to ask uh, a student from another part of the world? The Colombian students have any questions they would like to ask of the, of the students from US, both our students and, and my TAs. If, if anybody is fair to ask the question to anybody. So anything you wanna know about what school might be like or daily life or um, any, any topic that you wanna know, does anybody have a question? Oh, uh, let's see. Pablo has a, something in the chat. Can we see that the red light we see, can we say that the red light we see comes from an element with a bluish emission far away in both space and time? That is a great question. Uh, Professor, would you please address that question? Excellent, yes, indeed, it's an excellent question. Um, yes, that may well be the case. Uh, when we see galaxies far away, the redshift actually effect can stretch the blue photon, the blue light into red. Uh, in fact, it, an object can be so far away from us that uh, uh, the light can even be stretched further away from red to the infrared and our eyes cannot see it anymore. In that case, we need special instruments that can look at the infrared part uh, of the spectrum. Uh, the furthest away object we have seen uh, has a so-called redshift of 10. That's a very distant galaxy. That means that the wavelength from the galaxy coming to us has, has stressed already by around 10 times. So it starts with a wavelength, say, of uh, 100 nanometers and arrives to us at 1,000 nanometers. It's completely stretched by this huge uh, amount. I also have a question. Um, I was talking about like the, the expansion. Is there, since you said there isn't a general uh, center point, that means that they are always expanding at whatever um, way. So could that mean that we are expanding, I don't know, to the right? We are going to the right, but another galaxy is going to the left. Or are we generally generally going towards one side? Or since there is no center point, how do things gener generally collapse? Right, right. So as far as we can tell from the universe we are looking, and uh, looking at far away objects, which also you know back in time, but at large distances. The universe, the expansion seems to be the same everywhere we are looking. Uh, but uh, there's still the possibility that some other corner of the universe which we, for which we haven't got light yet may be expanding faster or slower than what we see in our, in our neighborhood. So that's why we keep looking actually at far away, at high redshifts, at far, far away objects to see that it could be actually that our universe is not this picture we have where everything is uh, homogeneous and isotropic, as we call it, where everything smoothly expands at the same rate and the same way. There's still the possibility that there are regions far away from us in the universe that do different things. These are really good questions. And on the topic of uh, uh, photons or light being stretched even beyond red, uh, the James Webb Telescope will be uh, we'll have infrared instrumentation to be able to see things that uh, see things much better than we've been ever able to see before in the infrared uh, region of the electromagnetic spectrum. And that would include things that are that have emitted light and are so far away that the light has stretched from blue or green or red into the infrared part of the spectrum. So there'll be more more about that in the news during the month. Anybody else have a question? I will let everybody know this will be the last SMAP of 2021. Uh, we will resume 
in January of 2022. And the topic for our January meeting, which I don't have a date for yet, but the topic will be exoplanets. So if you wanna know about exoplanets, stay tuned. I'll say thank you all for being here. It's been a pleasure and we'll see you next year. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Yes. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks everyone for coming. Pablo, if you're still here, uh, let me know, will you? Give me a symbol, a signal if you're still here. I said yes. Uh, professor, are you still here? Yes. Okay, so we have a question, Professor, from Pablo. And it is, did you capture a black hole as it eats the passing star? So do we have, uh, do we have evidence, uh, yes. any data from a black hole being consumed, or I'm sorry, a star being consumed by a black hole? That, that is correct, yes. It was 10 years ago. Um, when we saw a big explosion from the center of a nearby uh, galaxy, as uh, it was a quiet place and suddenly it starts flaring, sending us a lot of light from that region. And uh, actually I was involved in that uh, project. We were working in predicting this type of event. So what happens is that uh, uh, we have at the center of every galaxy a supermassive uh, black hole and the star just happened, a stray star happened to pass too close to this black hole. Uh, and the black hole, you know, it has a very strong gravity and actually it has the so-called tidal forces, which means it deforms objects. When you approach a, a black hole, you become like spaghetti, like you're deformed. And that's what happened to this uh, poor star. So it was distorted and broke apart. Uh, and the result is that the material of the, uh, the star ended up falling onto the black hole and they gave us a very, very bright uh, a source, very bright light. We have observed uh, several sources like this uh, since uh, then. So um, we have, uh, it just happens in a galaxy maybe once every 100,000 years that the star finds its way too close to the black hole and then it's ripped apart and uh, it feeds the black hole like a firework. Amazing. I can't think of a better way to end this session than from that question from Pablo. Thanks, Pablo. We'll see you next year. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks to my volunteers for being here. We'll see you next week. And special thanks to Professor Giannios. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. All right.